Hi learners, in this video, we are going to look into the work Come September by Arundhati Roy. Actually, it was a speech delivered by her for Lenan Foundation at Lensic Performing Arts Center, Santa Fe, New Mexico on 18th of September 2002. She is an Indian writer, actress, political and environmental activist too. She have won Booker Prize for Fiction in 1997 for her first novel, The God of Small Things. Other famous works of her are The Cost of Living, Listening to Grasshoppers, Field Notes on Democracy, and all. And she was awarded the Lenin Prize for Cultural Freedom in 2003 and the Sydney Peace Prize in 2004 in recognition of her involvement in human rights issues. So, talking about this speech come September by Arundhati Roy, it is easily available in internet. Uh, you can see she presenting the speech in YouTube. If you search for Come September by Arundhati Roy. So now let's get into the explanation of her speech. Before beginning her speech, Arundhati Roy says that she is going to be reading aloud what she have written. So she have already written it and she says two reasons for why she have did so. The first thing she says is that she is a writer and so she feels more comfortable when she writes. And the second reason she is saying is that the problem she is going to speak is quite complex and one must take care of the language used while treating such delicate subjects. She then begins her speech by stating that writers don't exactly invent stories. Rather, stories choose writers from the world and they insist upon being told. We often think that only fiction is considered as stories. But Roy says that both fiction and non-fiction may be taken as stories. As far as she is concerned, she believes that she can easily write fiction, but non-fiction has to be forced out of her. But whether it be fiction or non-fiction, one of her basic themes is the relation between power and powerlessness. On the surface level, her works might seem to be about history or nations, but she says that they are actually more about power. The ruthlessness and the physics of power is what she is concerned with in depicting in her works. Roy says that the governments of India and Pakistan keep promising their citizens that there will be a nuclear war and hence call the citizens of both these countries as brainwashed citizens. Arundhati Roy thinks about the relationship between citizens and the state and how citizens who have views that are not in accordance with the Indian government are branded or termed as anti-nationals. She attributes most of the genocide of the 20th century to nationalism. She describes flags as shrink wraps which are used by the government to cover and subsequently shrink the brains of their citizens in the name of nationalism. She also points out that it is a worrying matter when even artists like writers or painters etc. begin to mold their art for the service of the nation. She says that this sort of propaganda did happen in India in 1998 during the nuclear tests and in 1999 in Pakistan during the Kargil war. It even happened in the US during the Gulf war and it is happening now under the pretense of war against terror. And she gives China made US flags as an example for this. She states that she herself had been termed as anti-American for criticizing the American government's actions. This whole notion of anti-Americanism is turning into an ideology in itself. According to Roy, the term anti-American is used by the American establishment to define its critics. She says it's an inaccurate definition. Then she tries to define or give a meaning to this term, that is anti-American. And she points out that merging America's culture, its geographical beauty, the ordinary pleasures of ordinary people, the along with criticism of the American government's foreign policy, is actually a purposely created effective strategy. On the other hand, Roy says that there are many Americans who do not want to be associated with their government's policies. In fact, most of the time, the most severe and scholarly critics of the hypocrisy and contradictions in the US government policy comes from the American citizen itself. So, when non-Americans need to know about what's going on in America, 
they rely on americans like noam chomsky edward said howard zinn amy goodman etc then roy compares this american scenario with the present indian scenario where many indians would feel embarrassed and ashamed if they were in any way connected with the present indian government's authoritarian policies which curbed the rights of the state of kashmir and neglected the government led massacre against muslims in gujarat and just as people are termed anti american indians or people who criticize the indian government are also termed as anti indian by the government she questions the rights of the indian or american or any government to define what india or america should be then roy criticizes the extremes which such governments apply in supposing that if someone doesn't love them then they ought to hate them or if someone doesn't support bush then he must be a taliban supporter She also brings into light the fake agenda behind the US war against Afghanistan and shares her thoughts on how it actually began in the pretense of capturing Osama bin Laden and then turned into a pretense of liberating Afghan women from their burqas. She also points out that if the US actually had a feminist mission on their minds then why haven't they bothered about raising a war against Saudi Arabia? which is the country who supports them in their military operations and she points out that there are so many other countries like india pakistan bangladesh etc where women face injustices and other minority communities also suffer so should all these countries be bombed will bombing prove an effective remedy for these injustices can those social evils be bombed out of a place Does bombing have the ability to transport us to a feminist paradise? She asks. By raising these questions, Roy is obviously hinting at the pretentiousness, hypocrisy, and futility behind the reasons for the U.S. war against Afghanistan. Then Arundhati Roy goes on to say that it's a coincidence that she is in America in September, which is a month of terrible anniversaries. Nobody needs to remind anyone of the anniversary of 9/11. You automatically remember incidents that we just cannot forget. Roy recalls how almost 3000 ordinary citizens were killed in that terrorist attack on 9/11. She knows that the impact of that attack still remains. The memory of it remains quite fresh in everyone's mind and the pain of having lost their loved ones or the anger against those who did it hasn't quit gone yet. Roy says that there is a strange and deadly war burning around the world. And while she acknowledges that the 9/11 attacks impact or pain still remains, she also hints at the futility of war despite all this. She points out that all those people who lost their loved ones in this terrible terrorist attack also know deep inside that no war or no amount of revenge is going to bring back their loved ones or console the pain and sorrow or loss they are experiencing. In fact, according to Roy, all that war can do is to brutally violate or contaminate the memory of those dead loved ones. Roy believes that fueling a war based on these sentiments only devalues or degrades grief. And this whole concept of exploiting human feelings for political agendas or commercial purpose is a terrible thing for a country or state to do to its own people. Then Roy admits that it's not clever to talk about loss in a public platform and yet she would really love to talk about it. She wants to talk about what loss means to individual people or what it means to people who have learned to live it throughout their lives as if it was a constant companion. She is not bringing up this dread topic of 9/11 in order to accuse anyone or provoke anyone. instead she is doing it to take part in the sorrow and also to clear out some of the uncertainties related to it and very gently welcome america back to the world basically to help american citizens step out their sorrow and despair roy then recalls what happened in kyle on september 11 1973 when us backed general pinochet overthrew the democratically elected government 
So the first Marxian president to be democratically elected was found dead inside his palace and it still remains a mystery whether it was actually a suicide or a murder. Roy then enumerates that the terror and brutality that followed including the cutting of a musician's hand in public and then throwing his guitar back to him and mockingly asking him to play before being shot down. The dictatorship that followed not only killed people but also took the freedom and lives out of the living people and Roy says General Pinochet must be held responsible for stealing even the lives of the living Chileans. Through this narration, Roy also brings into view the insensitiveness of the US when General Pinochet was finally arrested in 1999. Roy says that there are many more countries where the Central Intelligence Agency of the US works in either openly or secretly. And then there are other countries which suffered under not the CIA but the US military interventions like Korea, Indonesia, etc. Roy reminds us of the fact that many Septembers had passed since the nuclear strikes in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and so many bombings and slaughterings of millions of Asian people have taken during so many September. She diverts from the topic and also mocks at how the National Atomic Museum has commercialized the atomic attack in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Then Roy states that September 11 has a tragic memory for the Middle East as well due to British colonialism. She calls Palestine and Kashmir as gifts of imperialism and British colonialism to the modern world. She then goes on to quote Winston Churchill and Israel Prime Minister's notions of Palestine and Palestinians. She notes that they all use the term like dog, grasshoppers and two-legged beast to describe Palestinians. And Roy reminds the world that these came from the mouths of the heads of state and not from ordinary people. The situation in Palestine still hasn't improved, according to Roy. The people in Palestine still live without dignity or any control over their natural resources. Many young Palestinians have turned themselves into human bombs or suicide bombers because of all the pent-up anger. Roy points out that Israel is still practicing colonialism in Palestine under the pretense of a new 21st century war. And as usual, it is America who backs and supports Israel in all their wars. A lot of financial support is provided by the US to Israel for this purpose. Here, Roy raises serious questions about condemning suicide bombers and whether the cruelty and violence they may have faced. For example, the Palestinians have been going through a war for around 80 years. So what can the world advise them to do once they do come out of it eventually? It is again on September 11th that George Bush made a speech to a joint session of Congress announcing the US government's decision to rage a war against Iraq. She then narrates how Saddam Hussein conducted a US and UK government's back genocide against his own people initially in 1988. In 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait on his own without any US or UK intervention which set his relation with them to deteriorate and so they decided to exterminate him. Roy points out that the US and UK governments casually decided to exterminate Saddam Hussein. So casually as if he were their pet and they had suddenly lost interest in the pet. And from 1991 onwards, both America and British fired thousands of missiles and bombs on Iraq for over a decade. And anyone who did talk or write against these wars were accused of moral equivalence. Apparently, a decade of bombing left Saddam Hussein untouched and so then the US took to raging a war against in the name of weapons asserting that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Roy notes that the US has the largest collection of weapons and military equipment and is the only country in the world to have used it on ordinary citizens. She also mocks at the recent US intervention in holding back a war that was about to rage between India and Pakistan. She asks sarcastically why it is so hard for the US to follow its own advice and stay away from wars. She accuses them of being guilty of uselessly moralizing as they waged wars while they preached about peace. 
Ironically, George Bush calls the US as the most peaceful nation on earth and here Roy points out that America has been at war with one country or an- another every year for the last 50 years. Roy then writes down how oil trade is another major concern for the US and Roy writes that it is oil that keeps the free market in America rolling and because of that the US believes that whoever controls the oil market controls the world. And this explains their recent interventions in the Balkans, Central Asia and their constant guarding over the Middle East. Roy states that the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman in his article titled Crazy in a Space and in his book called The Lexus and the Olive Tree has written very accurately and briefly about corporate globalization. Here Roy tries to give us a clear picture on how America uses the free market also as one of their weapons and then she sarcastically draws out the contrast between the ideals of Al-Qaeda and America, how the former stands for the world and the latter stands for profit. She equates US with Al-Qaeda, Qaeda means profit in Urdu. So this is merely Roy's way of playing around with words and also the same time pointing out that America is not that different from the terrorist organization of Al-Qaeda that they always seem to be so against. Al-Qaeda wears Al-Qaeda she says and although at present it looks as if Al-Qaeda is winning the war, Roy says you never know when things may change and flip around. Then throughout the rest of the essay Roy paints a bleak picture of the effect of corporate globalization. She notes how corporate globalization has not been able to reduce the number of poor people in the country despite having raised the world's total income. And what is actually happening under the banner of corporate globalization in plundering of natural resources, privatization of water, undermining of democracies, etc. And in developing countries like India, this project of corporate globalization is cutting through the lives of people. And so, poorer are getting poorer and richer are getting richer, which is leading to a kind of civil unrest or discord among people. And in order to suppress or control those who are protesting against corporate globalization, governments label such protesters as terrorists, says Roy. But what Roy means by civil unrest is not just protest, but also a tendency to commit more crimes and other terrible things start cropping up like cultural nationalism, religious intolerance, fascism, and the most obvious one is terrorism. So according to Roy, these evils are the outcome of corporate globalization. Roy points out that the concept that the free market will break down national barriers and the final destination of corporate globalization is a sort of paradise where everyone can live together happily inside John Lennon's song is just a made-up story or a rumor. Inside, she's talking about the uh, song Imagine There's No Country. Then she says that the free market is in fact weakening or suppressing democracy and corporate globalization in order to attain its aims sometimes use the police, the courts and times even the army. So Roy says that the police, the court and the army are merely pretending to deliver justice and keep the law. So basically what what's being globalized is not respect for human rights or free movement of people or awareness about racial discrimination but instead movements of goods, money, patents and profitable services. So Roy points out that a year after the US declared war against Afghanistan, each country in the world has sort of been losing freedom in the pretense of protecting freedom and democracy. And any kind of difference of opinion is treated or labeled as terrorism. And different kinds of laws are being passed in order to sustain the suppression of freedom in the name of terrorism. And sarcastically, Roy points out that Bin Laden and Mullah Omar are not even in the picture. They seem to have disappeared altogether and even the Taliban have disappeared. But unfortunately, their spirit is still alive. This spirit, according to Roy, is coming up in the least expected places like India. Pakistan, Nigeria, America, Afghanistan and in all Central Asian republics under the US-backed Northern Alliance. And meanwhile, all natural resources and all signs of 4,600 million years of evolution are being put up for sale. Mockingly, Roy says that even justice is up for sales and that anyone who has money can buy it easily.
Then Donald Rumsfeld said that his aim in the war against terror was to convince the world that Americans must be allowed to continue their way of life. Roy replies that the so-called American way of life is not exactly that sustainable as they don't seem to accept that there is a world beyond America. Donald Rumsfeld was a retired American politician who served as Secretary of Defense under Gerald Ford and under George W. Bush. And despite the bleak and terrifying picture of the world that Roy painted up till now in the essay, she senses that there is hope as even power has a shelf life. Hence, it will explode or go out of use one day. In fact, Roy feels that cracks and bleedings have already started to appear. Roy feels that the world is essentially being run by three organizations and not democracy. These three organizations are the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. And all three of these are dominated by the US. But such a world run by leaders whom nobody elected or nobody even knows is definitely not going to last for long, says Roy. She further points out that Soviet-style communism failed because it allowed too few people to seize too much power. And Roy believes that 21st century market capitalism is also doomed to fail just like this because of same reasons. Both of these notions, the Soviet-style communism and capitalism, are after all constructs of the human mind and therefore incomplete. Then she ends the essay by saying that probably things will get better after they get worse first. Maybe solutions will be sent down from heaven. Some little God is either preparing for us or is already on her way. Although many of us won't be here to greet her on really quiet days. Roy says she can hear this little God breathing. Basically, Roy is conveying the fact that there is hope for the world and it's not too far away. Roy thanks her listeners and ends this enlightening speech. Now, some of the main points made in the essay by Roy are the ill effects of globalization and capitalism, the hypocrisy of the US, the misuse of nationalism and the growing gap between rich and poor. She also focused on other historical events that took place in the month of September in which Countries like America itself had unleashed similar kinds of attacks as the September 11th attack. Roy mocks and sarcastically presents her opinions with the effective use of puns, phrases and apt quotations which she combined with her political knowledge in order to expose the injustices of the present world scenario. However, she also provides hope for a better world in future in the last of her essay. So that's all about this uh, speech come September by Arundhati Roy. Thank you for watching.